Hello, everybody, and welcome to this dot JavaScript state of testing. This is a semi annual event that we put on to talk about everything happening in the world of front end testing. Very excited to have some awesome testing experts here today. We have Simon Beckis from uh, Folio and a core contributor to Jest. We have Gleb over here, who is a VP of engineering at Cypress. Vikram Subramanian, who is on the Angular core team at Google. Adam Carmi, a co-founder and CTO of Apple Tools. Guillermo Rausch, who is the founder of Zite. Kevin Lamping, who is a developer with test automation and uh, also a web driver. So, Big thanks to our sponsors, Apple Tools, as well, for sponsoring this awesome event we have semi-annually. Uh, they do visual testing, and you should definitely check them out at appletools.com. In addition to that, uh, giving you guys an update on some interesting events that we have coming up. So we will have State of Browsers coming up. I believe that is in May, so look out for that. And we also have GraphQL Contributor Days happening in May as well. So check those out at this.co. Um, my name is Tracy. You can follow me on Twitter at Lady Leap. I will be monitoring. If you have any questions during the live stream, you can go ahead and ask those in the live chat, or you can use the hashtag thisjs on Twitter as well. So conversation definitely doesn't stop here. Uh, and I think that is it for me. And I think I want to just jump in really quickly. And we are going to get started with Simon, who again is a developer at Folio and a core contributor to Jest. And Simon, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you. Did it show up correctly? Yep, you're good to go. Perfect. So, uh, Kulki, who am I? I'm a JavaScript developer living in Oslo, Norway. I work at a company called Folio, and uh, it's a startup we just launched last week, uh, creating a bank for small businesses. And I've also got the highest number of contributions to Jest in the last two and a half years, which I guess is the most interesting thing in this context. Um, more and more people are starting to use Jest. This is the downloads charts for last year. It's been a crazy 2019, as you can see, um, more than tripling our downloads. And I'd like to quickly touch on why I think that is. Um, mostly, I think, is because it's uh, batteries included. So you don't have to install anything other than Jest, and then you run Jest, and all your tests will run, no matter how you configure it. Uh, out of the box, it sort of just works, zero config, which is a meme at this point, I suppose. but uh, just actually works that way. But if you have some sort of weird configuration, you can still configure it to do whatever you want. Um, it has a cool watch mode. and But one of the main things is, of course, that Facebook developed and uses it um, very visibly in the community. So whenever you use React, for instance, the number one um, guide is always to just. And since it's so big, uh, that means that other people are creating plugins for it. So if whatever IDE you use, uh, whatever terminal you use, whatever OS you use, it's probably going to work just fine. Um, and this is, we're very proud of this. This is a screenshot from the state of JS 2018, where it just won the high satisfaction award. So we seem to be doing something right. It's not just big because it's big. Um, one thing I want to quickly talk about, um, since this went to the top of Hack and Use, actually, that just has migrated to TypeScript recently. Um, the, uh, it was pretty quick. It just took a month. Um, but I'd like to touch on why, because people seem to take it as like a political statement or something, uh, which is far from the truth. We just wanted to encourage community contributions. Just has a lot of community contributions already. Um, we have close to 1,000. I checked just now, it's 920 contributors uh, to the repo. But we like even more, because it's it's basically done, right? It can do whatever you want to do, but there's still a bunch of features that people want. And our thought was that since a lot of people are using TypeScript and even more wants to use it, maybe we can like have them come to Jest and make a small contribution so they can 
dip their toes in the world of TypeScript. Um, it's also a monorepo, and um, so we publish a lot of modules from it. And um, we want other people to use them, of course. And by being TypeScript, it's better in the integrations, in their own editors and their own tools. Um, so future plans for Jest, like I mentioned, it might be considered done. Um, we had a release just yesterday, um, which is likely to be the last release of the version 24 major line. Um, the last couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of performance and memory improvements. So hopefully, it'll help people complaining about uh, performance in the last few releases. Um, version 25 will come soon. And the main highlight, I think, is that we're going to look at the configuration. We have over 50 configuration options. And they a lot of them overlap. And it might be hard to configure. Um, We'd also like to upgrade to the newest version of JSON, um, which requires the drop node 6, which is why we haven't done it yet. And one of, I'm pretty excited about the changing. By default, Jest uses uh, JSON to run that test, which is great if you're writing browser tests or, or React, for instance. Uh, but a lot of people think that Jest is just for React, which is wrong. It's for JavaScript. So we're going to swap. Uh, by default to a node environment instead in the next version. So that, um, in general, all your tests will run quicker if you don't need a DOM. You don't need a document or window. You just have JavaScript on a test. Um, and we're also going to uh, swap out our fake times implementation for Blolex, which is the one in sign-on.js. And that will give us support for um, a lot of stuff we don't have today, like micro task queue and immediates and stuff like that. Um, so that's actually it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I love it when um, I love it when you know things are done. You know, so I love that you're saying that justice done. I feel like on RxJS as well, you know, Ben's like, it's gonna be done. But then, you know, we always see, uh, you know, well, we're gonna rewrite the internals to make it better. So I'm so curious after you're done to see what happens next. Um, and I think that's actually a very important point as well that you brought up that, you know, just isn't just, just isn't just for React as well. Um, in the live chat, if you're not writing React and you're using Just, love to hear from you and kind of see how you're using it. Uh, and you can follow Simon on Twitter at S B E K K H U S. Is that right, Simon? That's correct. Right. Thank you. Pretty sure. Yes. Thank you so much for presenting. Uh, next up, we're going to go ahead and have Gleb, who is a VP of Engineering at Cypress. And he's going to be talking about a lot of exciting things, including using uh, JSON schemas during testing. So Gleb, I'll let you take it away. Let me share my screen. I think it's going. Yep, looks great. Excellent. Uh, yes, I'm Gleb. I snagged gleb.dev, so that's my domain now. Uh, you can find me on GitHub, and you can find this slide at slide.com slash Uh I work at a company called Cypress.io, end-to-end test run for anything that runs in the browser, and we had a real-world problem. So, you know, we have multiple versions of our test runner reporting to our test results to our API, and you can see the test results in a dashboard web application, and you want to rewrite the whole thing and actually allow parallel testing where multiple test runners can produce results and all coordinate. And the problem was that the sequence of calls would be completely different, right, between the Cypress 3.0 and API. And yet we want to keep all the old test runners still working and all the old data still you know, there so that we can see everything. And so the question was, well, what kind of data is flowing through all those boundaries between the test runner and the REST API and between REST API and the web application? And I think it's a really common problem to have this complex system where you're trying to add new feature and not break everything. So we looked around, well, all the old REST calls were in a wiki and that's just not maintainable. And the problem is that every time data cross the boundaries, something can go wrong. You might accidentally forget that there is a field. 
you break something and it's really hard to keep it in check. So we needed a system to, to check complex JSON objects with a flowing so we can verify that we're not breaking something accidentally. So we looked around and we settled on JSON schema. So JSON schema is a draft proposal that describes what properties an object can have in a JSON format. And there are libraries for every language. It looks like this, where every property can have a type and it can have required properties, additional properties. But we extended JSON schemas with descriptions because we want every property to be described. We want to generate documentation. We give each JSON schema assembler because data changes and evolves, and we want to know like how it did it evolve. We also, for each JSON schema object, provide an example. And this is really, really um, necessary. We provide a library of assort and other functions that allow you to check schema. So for example, you can check if an object is valid and matches the schema. And if everything matches, well, no problem. You go on. And let's say a bad object, it doesn't just throw an error. Instead, it throws what we call an explanation. It throws a really good error message that looks like this. Well, first you explain what went wrong, then you explain why it's wrong, like a text property is missing, and then you give an example, like this is what we expected to see. And, and this error message becomes super useful for real world data, where imagine giant JSON object of test results is missing one deep nested field for some reason. We also provide functions that generate markdown documentation from JSON schemas. And we publish this open source project at, in our NPM Cypress um, namespace. We make schemas now, we publish them as NPM packages, and then we import and use them from like a API, from a test runner. And now all the places are protected. Our API checks the incoming data, outgoing data. And in staging and testing, we actually throw errors if uh, schemas don't match. In production, we just raise an error message, but we don't actually break anything because we don't want users to suffer. Uh, here's an example how we use JSON schemas in end-to-end -end tests. In a lot of our tests, we use fixture data that should simulate the real world. So we have methods that load a fixture file and then assert that it matches expected schema. And if something is wrong, well, excellent error message that explains what goes wrong. We also validate network requests from our end-to-end -end test. And if something goes wrong, well, we get a nice error message as well. And I have an example project that shows both of those concepts. But there is another project in testing, and that is dynamic data. Think timestamps, think UUID, random emails. So oftentimes, if you try to use, for example, Jeff, like Simon said, well, you cannot just snapshot this object because the UAD is dynamic. It will change every time I run this test. So what do we do? We say, well, UUID, we expect really a string, but we know this information already. Our JSON schema describes what kind of property is that. So this is a duplicate information. So in JSON schemas in our library, you can say default value for dynamic data. And then let's say a property has format UAD now, the sequence of calls is a little bit different. First, you assert that the data matches the schema, and then you call another library method called sanitize, which will replace all dynamic data with default values. And we know the schema is already good, so we know we can safely replace it. And then you match the snapshot. And so now the snapshot is all good and can be reliably uh, compared against every time. So now we reach my happy place, everything is working. So just to summarize, JSON schemas is a portable way, serializable way, where libraries for every language and every environment of importing and checking those JSON schemas. It's super useful to document and validate all the data flowing through a system. And the best thing, we you know, brought Cypress V3. We didn't break anything. There were no major disruptions, just tiny things, and everything just keeps working. And if something goes wrong, there is a beautiful error message. And our next step is actually we're going away from REST API to GraphQL API. And one of our engineers, Tim Greiser, has excellent project that's open source called Nexus, 
where from code he generates all the schemas for database access, for TypeScript definitions, for everything, and for GraphQL. So a single code definition will generate all the schemas for every possible way. And that's my update. Find it on slides.com and you know give Cypress a star. And that's my story. Thank you so much, Glab. It's very exciting to see uh, you also adding in a, or moving to GraphQL, actually. We are. Um, yeah, very exciting. I should invite you to GraphQL contributor today, Sam. <laughs> so uh, going back a little bit, I had uh, somebody in the live chat actually ask Simon. So Simon, this is kind of a broad question, but Michael asks, where can we find out more about Jest? <laughs> Um, well, you can Google it. That's the start. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, we have a website, which actually got recently a facelift. So it's very beautiful now with awesome animation. And uh, I, I like to think that our documentation and getting started guides are pretty good. And if not, we have, well, PRs are welcome, of course. But we also have a pretty vibrant Discord community where you can ask all your questions. Great. And what's the website? Is it just.com? Probably not. Uh, just just js.io. Just js.io. It's yeah. just js. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And again, if you have any additional questions for any of our speakers, feel free to post them in the live chat. Okay. Next up, we're going to have Vikram Subramanian. He is on the Angular core team at Google focusing a lot of, on a lot of really cool stuff, including testing. So uh, you can follow Vikram on Twitter at Vikraman. And Vikram, I'll let you take it over from here. Cool. Hi. Um, so today I'm here to talk about testing, but not really about testing, something that can make your whole testing story easier. Um, and I'm trying to project. All right. Cool. Um, so yeah, um, I'm here to talk about uh, essentially using compilers to reduce defects uh, in your project, uh, and as well as reduce uh, the burden you have uh, on uh, testing. Um, so I mean, everybody knows uh, testing is good, and compared to debugging, you don't want to be deb debugging your code, uh, especially in production. Uh, when you do uh, write tests along with your code, you're able to surf surface defects um, in the context of the change that you're making so that you you don't have to go back and debug and figure out what's happening, right? Uh, but uh, writing tests is still hard, and uh, especially for areas like security, uh, performance, accessibility, uh, you don't want to be just writing tests to find out all the problems in these areas, right? So uh, so this talk is about uh, essentially uh, what else can we use? What else do we have in our toolbox to uh, make uh, finding defects easier and not just depend on tests, right? So, uh, so I just want to present like essentially using compiler checks in addition to uh, tests to making finding defects easier, right? So. Compilers, like something like a TypeScript compiler, uh, does uh, type checking. And it does uh, help you to uh, avoid certain class of defects uh, that you don't have to keep uh, writing tests for. right? Uh, and in, in general, uh, so the idea is, can we extend the, these compiler checks even further to reduce our burden on testing? right? And what that means is we are uh, intentionally reducing the set of accepted uh, programs by the compiler, right? To, so that you know it's, it's sort of like your uh, application stays within certain uh, guardrails to uh, ensure things like functionality, performance, uh, security, and things like that. So uh, we have a tool uh, that Alex Eagle uh, in the Angular team uh, wrote called CC. Uh, which is essentially a TypeScript compiler plugin. And uh, one of the uh, uh, the main ideas is that you are able to promote like TSLint warnings to compiler error. So like, how does it uh, help, right? So one of the things that we actually made like um, 
globally uh, as an error across Google is uh, uh, we identified uh, different APIs where we say that if you are not actually using or checking the return value of that API, it's a compiler error, right? You, you cannot actually uh, check in that code. Uh, so things like array concat or string substring, like it's almost always an error if you are not actually using uh, the return values uh, because these don't change the actual array or string, but actually return a value which you must be using, right? And uh, uh, another example which is slightly related to testing uh, that we implemented is must use promise. So this is in the case of Protractor, uh, and we were migrating tests from the older control flow way of writing things, uh, where things look synchronous, but use chain promises in the background. It was very dif difficult to debug, so we wanted to migrate the whole of Google to using async await, right? Uh, so we could tell people that, but then they were coming back and telling us async await is difficult to use, uh, because it's uh, easy to miss the await somewhere. Uh, it, like in this example, it's actually inside an expect, and it's easy to miss things like that. So, uh, and even doing a code review is not uh, easy for things like this. So this is where actually compilers can actually help. So we put a rule saying any uh, API returning a promise inside an ASIC function must be awaited, right? And so this reduces a whole class of uh, bugs that we usually find and could actually make our tests flaky, right? Um, so this is the basic idea, and we are trying to uh, extend it to other areas other than just functionality. So we are thinking about like security, performance, and accessibility, and we have different compilers, right? So it's not just TypeScript compiler. Uh, Angular itself has an Angular compiler. Uh, which we are uh, extending, trying to extend uh, using Codelizer, which is like the TS lint for Angular, um, and essentially trying to uh, figure out how, what are the dangerous parts of JavaScript or the DOM APIs, which makes your uh, program insecure or non-performant, right? And so that um, it's it's. Uh, also a trade-off, like so it, developers don't like it when you don't allow certain things, but um, we want to uh, have a trade-off between what are the good checks where we know that these are almost always a problem, right? Uh, and so I also want to emphasize that adding these checks is not a silver bullet and we need to use it in combination with tests. Uh, so that is the other kind of trade-off we are thinking about and seeing how to balance. For example, in performance, uh, we can add checks to make it difficult to write non-performant code, uh, but it won't, at the end of the day, catch every sort of uh, performance issues that your uh, front end is going to have. So we are thinking of using it with more traditional uh, performance checks, like having uh, budgets for your uh, JavaScript bundle sizes, and including Lighthouse and web page tests as part of your continuous integration tests. So uh, that essentially is, uh, is just a short uh, blurb of what we are thinking in terms of like uh, not just writing tests, but using compilers and other things in your toolbox to avoiding defects, right? So, uh, so the summary is essentially use compilers and conjecture to tests to make your developers and users happy. All right. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Go ahead and stop representing right there. Very cool, and again, you can follow Vikram on Twitter at Vikraman on Twitter if you have any questions, or go ahead and post it in the live chat. I'm gonna continue with some of the live chat questions. This is actually um, another question for Simon, for Jess. Uh, Jay Chang says, is Jess good for HTTP request mock? If it is not, how about knock um, good question. We have knock should work um, because you still have access to you can do require HTTP, which is how knock works. It intercepts everything. Uh, normally, I think that's to like low level and would prefer to either mock out the API that does the HTTP request or start up an actual 
Express server or something like it. Um, yeah, but yes, it is possible to use the knock if you want. Awesome. Thank you for answering that question. And again, if you have any additional questions, feel free to keep posting them in the live chat. Uh, next up, we're going to go ahead and have Adam Carmi, who is the co-founder and CTO of Apple Tools, uh, go ahead and give a talk about visual testing. Hot topic these days. And I'll let you take it away, Adam. Thank you very much, Tracy. So awesome, awesome talk so far. Um, can you see my screen OK? Yes, we can. Great. So today I'll talk about how to effectively test your CSS. Uh, if we look at how most uh, front-end developers test today, the sad uh, reality is that most of them don't. And those that do would usually run unit tests or functional UI testing with tools like Cypress, WebDriver.io, Selenium, et cetera. So here's an example of such a functional UI test. In this case, we want to validate that uh, a user that tries to sign in without uh, providing email or password actually get an error message uh, indicating that those fields are required. So the way that we would express that in Cypress is very easy and concise. Glad, excellent job. Um, we just visit the login page, then locate the sign in button and click it. And then in lines 8 to 17, we simply start asserting stuff locating the error items, the error elements by their validation error class, making sure that they have the proper text, and then making sure that the sign-in button is still there for the user to retry. But what happens if a developer, another developer on our team or in a different team changes the CSS and unintentionally modifies the login page? As you would expect, our uh, Cypress test would still pass. And the reason we should expect it is because it is testing a very specific functionality and it is not trying to uh, validate the way that the UI looks. And uh, this means that if we, the risk here is that if we don't have other means to verify how the UI looks like, we just might, this change might go unnoticed and we push this bug to production. So how can we test the UI? I mean, an average web page can have hundreds of elements, and every element has dozens of attributes that affect the way that it is rendered. And, it, so, and it's really unlikely that we're going to add hundreds of assertions to every step in our test to validate the UI. And beyond that, how can we make sure that the application looks right, renders correctly on all different form factors and viewport sizes uh, that affect its layout? How can we make sure that it renders correctly on different browsers that use different layout engines that all have a slightly different interpretation for the same DOM and CSS. What if the, we have Canvas and WebGL components that don't even have elements to assert on? And even if we don't change a line of code in our, in our system, still a new Chrome browser version comes out and it might be incompatible with your application. So the answer to this question is visual testing. And the way that you do it with Applitools is that basically you just add a visual assertion or a visual checkpoint, as we call it, which validates the entire window with one line of code. It captures a screenshot of the page or a component if you want to test a specific component and compares that with a baseline image that defines the expected appearance of the page. And if there is any difference, it fails the test. Very simple. Now, what's more impressive about it is the fact that it doesn't matter where your test is running. So if it's Cypress and it's running on Chrome, you can still visually validate that page on any combination of browser, viewport size, device, and operating system. Uh, and the way that it works is that instead of capturing a screenshot, what we do is basically capture all the resources that are used by the browser to render the page locally. We upload the differences to our visual grid, which con which where we host our own devices and browsers. And then we simultaneously render the same resources on all these different combinations of environment details. The result is that you can run hundreds of visual tests in less than a minute, which is super powerful and super cool, actually, if you haven't seen it in action. Now, if you have a difference, it's very easy to visualize and see it. You go to the Applitools dashboard, you can see the checkpoint and baseline image, 
toggle the two and clearly see what changed. In this case, you can see the difference in the uh, signing button. Everyone in the team that knows how the product is, should look like can actually do this maintenance thing. Um, beyond just seeing what change, you can also see what caused the change. So for example, if we click the sign-in button, we can immediately see what change in the page implementation. We can see that we have a CSS rule that was removed that actually causes the text to be uppercased. And we have two CSS rules that were changed that caused the background and border and color of the, of the uh, text to change and also affected the viewport size. So that can save a lot of time uh, getting to the root cause of differences uh, very quickly without uh, starting to dig into code. Now, maintaining baseline is very simple and trivial as well. All you need to do is just accept the new screenshots. And we have plenty of features in the product where, which allow you to really scale up your tests without increasing the maintenance overhead. So in this example here, you can see how the, the tool can actually uh, show you only unique results. So if you have a visual uh, difference that spans over hundreds of pages, um, and it's the same difference, you just see it once. Did we lose his audio? Yes, we did. And you only need it. Can you hear me now, Tracy? Yes, we can, yes. Okay, so should I go back to anything or was it long? Um, it was five seconds. Okay, so never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the last thing uh, I'll mention is that, um, of course, uh, visual testing needs to integrate with you know the day-to-day -day workflow and we do integrate with bug trackers uh, making it easier to report bugs uh, with CI systems like Jenkins, Travit, Circle, and many others, and also with uh, with uh, um, um, SEM systems like uh, Bitbucket and GitHub, where you can quickly uh, uh, view, initiate, and and maintain uh, visual test results directly from your pull requests. So. I hope that despite of the audio interruptions, I managed to uh, get you interested in visually testing your UI. And if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them, or you can visit applitools.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, you can follow Adam on Twitter at Carmi Adam. That's C-A-R-M-I Adam. Uh, Apple Tools definitely, from a visual testing perspective, has change a lot of perception. If you've done visual testing in the past and thought I can never do this because it is so painful, um, Apple Fool, the technology has come quite far. So highly recommend you check it out. Also, if you're an open source library, there are free licenses for you. So you can check those out as well. And I believe there's a link to the appletools.com website for the free license if you have an open source project. Next up, I'm very excited to have Guillermo as well, who's the founder of Zeit, and he's going to be talking about testing serverless deployments with integrations. So Guillermo, I'll let you take it away from here. Hello, I'm going to share my screen. Yes. Works, looks good. Great. Um, let me adjust, I'm going to share my entire screen really quick. Mm -hmm. There we go. Hey, yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm Guillermo Rauch and the founder and CEO of Zeit, uh, which is a company that tries to make serverless uh, computing approachable to everyone in the world. So you can go to my website, rauchg.com, or you can follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash rauchg. And I decided to start off by sharing my Twitter because I'm, um, sort of famous for having tweeted something like this, write tests, not too many, mostly integration. So I wanted to uh, dissect this today and sort of speak how serverless and the code that you write can sort of give context to this quote. So by not too many, what we mean is similar to what Vikram was saying earlier, that there are a lot of things that you can do when you're coding. There are a lot of things that you can do with compilers to ensure correctness. The not too many part doesn't mean that you should put out flaky code. It mostly means that testing is not always your only 
uh, tool in your toolbox for ensuring correctness and reliable operation and performance and security. And in a lot of cases, those things are uh, hard to test. The mostly integration part has to do with you can, when you do write tests, start off by writing broad ones that allow you to capture a wide range of correctness problems and that relate to the experience of your end user. So the mostly integration part is how can you write tests that relate to how your customers are going to be experiencing your product. So I'm gonna do a quick demo of how I think we can accomplish this with serverless, not just integration testing, but using integrations. So for context, um, you can go to our company's website, zai.co slash now. Now is our platform for serverless deployment. And the basic idea is that you don't need to write servers, you don't need to manage servers, and you don't need to monitor servers. So what you focus on is the serverless function as sort of your service of responsibility when you're writing code. If you use React, for example, you can think of the service of responsibility of your code as a page. When you use Next.js, for example, is, hey, I'm not gonna write an entire server for this, I'm just gonna focus on a page. So uh, to get started, you can go ahead and write now init, which will sort of bootstrap a project. In this case, I'm gonna do an express example because I think it's the, uh, kind of relatable to everyone in the world by now, Node.js plus the express framework. If you don't wanna use the terminal, you can go to xyloco slash new, where we're gonna walk you through creating a project with different examples. So now that I have my project, the premise of our platform is for you, the end user, all you need to do is right now to deploy it. So I'm gonna deploy this project called Express. It's gonna give me my URL to where it lives. Um, it's live instantly. You can sort of navigate through your uh, project in real time. And notice that there's sort of this uh, random part here, but then you have a memorable URL right here. So let's dig into what exactly, how exactly this works. I'm gonna force a new deployment instead of sort of my cached one right there. And you're gonna see that what it's doing is it's building and compiling your functions sort of separately and concurrently. We'll uh, talk about later on how this can be also your testing facility as well, because each one of your entry points of your application, instead of everything being a monolithic server, is a function. So even though Express typically is regarded as a technology for creating servers, the way that we're using it specifically here is we're defining a specific functions as the entry point of your application. So notice here that I'm sort of uh, using some uh, middleware, like in this case, I'm using Helmet to set some security headers, but I'm also sort of handling every possible method and every possible route and then exporting my function. So if we go back to this idea that you should focus only on one function at a time, we can, you can see how we can do it so effectively with Express. So this is the index route that maps to my index page here. And then for my about route, I'm going to go to the specific function for that. And we're sort of gonna see that it's its own Express app, sort of mini app again, uh, all on its own. So I notice as well that each of these functions are compiled to specific outputs that are all independently testable and more importantly, independently deployable. So if I change only one function, I'm not sort of redeploying everything that it didn't touch. So in, in the spirit of increasing correctness, you can sort of imagine how an entire team can sort of work on different parts of the application without sort of breaking the work of others. Um, okay, so going forward to the, the core idea here is how do I test this? So there are two approaches typically, right? Like we would go ahead and like write a bunch of tests and they create a text folder for each independent function and that's okay. But another thing that we can do here is like, for example, we support right out of the bat um, TypeScript. So if I were to sort of improve the correctness level of my project, I would say, hey, I'm gonna, instead of using uh, JS, I'm gonna move this into TypeScript. And all I have to do is let the system know that I also want to build my TS files as well. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about was, okay, if I ensured as much correctness as possible over my function code, what can I do to sort of test the entire thing in an integrated manner? So this is where the integrations come in. And for, for this demo, what I'm gonna focus on is GitHub. 
um, you can go to xyloco slash GitHub to learn more. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to talk about the deployments and checks. But uh, we also support GitLab. More uh, SCM systems are uh, coming um, uh, and will be supported soon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the project that I just created with Now We Need Express if you want to retry it at home. And by the way, if you haven't not heard of Now, the easiest way to install it is npm install dash g now. And then you get your um, client set up right there. So I'm going to create a project on GitHub to sort of demonstrate how deployments and checks work. So I'm going to call this project my Super Express demo if GitHub response. I'm going to mark it private because it's not interesting to the public yet. I'm going to run git init. So now I have my project. I'm going to, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to create a commit. Okay, so because I already installed the now application onto my GitHub, you're going to see that if I go to commits, it's already being deployed. So it didn't care that I had deployed it locally. This system is always trying to create a deployment for every single push. So we talked about earlier how when I run now, I got my own unique URL. So notice here, oh, and I, I'm going to revert my little change here because we probably didn't test it. So this actually shows you how easy it is to sort of correct the mistakes. So I'm going to create another commit, and it's also going to get its own independent deployment. So the checks come in. Great. And just like I did earlier on my local host by running now, it's now doing it in the cloud, which actually has a very interesting um, benefit in terms of correctness because I'm no longer doing the builds locally. I'm relying 100% on the cloud to do the build. So now that the deployment is ready, I can access it. Obviously, we don't expect any changes to happen because it's exactly what we did earlier. Um, we get our deployment, et cetera. OK, so the cool thing here is you're going to see that uh, when I refresh my GitHub commits status, it says, OK, the deployments are ready. And I get one check per function that I deployed inside my project. So how do I go to, about testing this? So recently, what we introduced is this idea that instead of just relying on checks like Circle CI or Travis CI do, we tell GitHub that this is actually a deployment. So to show you how that works is, I'm going to make a little change, and I'm going to submit it as a pull request. So say hello from my PR. And I'm going to use this cool GitHub functionality that creates a new branch and a new PR. So I'm going to submit a PR, just like everyone in your team would do when they're evolving your project or sort of correcting a mistake, et cetera. Instead of pushing to master, I'm going to now uh, deploy a, um, a PR. So you're going to see that now immediately is setting, OK, I'm, it's a new commit. It's, an, it's new work. I'm going to deploy it. I'm going to build it, kind of like we did earlier. But one thing that's really cool is we're telling GitHub here that this is a deployment. And in particular, we're telling GitHub that this is a staging deployment. So notice that here, it's not only that it's running checks, but it's telling, hey, I'm deploying to staging here. So once it's done, GitHub now knows that I have a deployment. So I can actually, again, go to it. The next step here would be, how can we add functionality for testing this deployment that would actually go to the URL? So going back to the idea that we want to be true to what the customer is going to experience, ideally, our test suite is going to run against this very URL that I just created. Because if I merge this PR to master, that's the URL that then is going to become, for example, mywebsite.com. So in fact, um, notice that here we made a change that said, hello from my PR. So if I were to go to Express, I think my project was called Express at routeg.now.sh, you're going to see that it says, hello from now 2.0. But we, what we actually probably want is for it to say, hello from my PR 
from now to point now, uh, or my express path, I think it's. Yeah. So this one says express path, and this one says hello from uh, express path, PR, et cetera. So ideally, what uh, someone in your team would do is like, hey, oh, this looks good. You know, the, the code looks good. I tested it. I, I went to the URL myself. So I'm now going to merge it. But ideally, we would want a test suite to run and block the merging of this PR. So ever since we introduced the integration uh, with GitHub deployments, we've now uh, uh, enabled an entire suite of applications, such as Ghost Inspector, for example, to kick in. And once the deployment happens, activate an end-to-end -end user suite of tests that are going to go against a very live URL, similar to what's going to happen when I merge that PR. So um, in this uh, blog post, and you can go to our blog, it's called Now for GitHub Improved UI and Security and Automated Tests. We walk you through how you can install, for example, on top of the Now integration, uh, Ghost Inspector to run and simulate end-to-end -end user uh, tests. Another example that I want to talk about is a company called Assertable. So this is a PR from Zy.co, the very dashboard in everything that powers our application. So we use Now ourselves to build the Now interface. So all, everything that you're seeing here, my uh, dashboard, Express, et cetera, is all built on uh, using our own product. And here I have a PR that someone submitted in my team to improve the URLs of our product. Um, and notice that when I go, so ev uh, as I mentioned earlier, everyone that deploys gets their own URL. And something interesting that you're going to notice is that um, in addition to just uh, writing correctness tests, we went ahead and set end-to-end -end tests with a searchable that go to those URLs that we that we created as a result of this push and will test run 16 end-to-end -end tests and only if that passes we actually enable the merging of that PR so this is a way of testing that actually completely segregates your code that focuses on your application from the actual end-to-end -end tests that you can set up with that third-party application and by doing so you create an end-to-end -end workflow that gives uh, your uh, developers the ability to test by pressing show deployment, but also installing testing tools that are able to visit that deployment and then um, inform the end reviewer whether that PR is good to merge or not. So that's all I have for today. I think it's a very exciting new way of thinking about testing. And um, yeah, I'm open for questions as well. Awesome. That was really great. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions in the chat, and um, they're not necessarily for you, Guillermo, yet, but I'm going to go ahead and go to Red. So Red says um, to Adam, you mentioned WebDriver IO, which does support visual regression testing. So what are the advantages of using it instead of its package? OK, so this is a very big uh, question with a long answer. I'll do my best to keep it very, very short. OK. Um, so first of all, it's important to say that uh, there is an integration between WebDriver.io and AppliTools as well. So whoever is using WebDriver.io can uh, use AppliTools, and it works fantastically. Um, and this brings to one of the one of the less important advantages that in, individuals have, but companies do like, is the fact that AppliTools supports over forty different SDKs that can basically test anything from web applications to desktop applications to mobile native applications in any programming language, any UI technology you can think of, even PDF files. So. When a company buys uh, this product, they can use it but every, in all the different teams, no matter what technologies they use. So this is the least, the, this is the least important one. So I think that the main differentiator is the scale. Okay, so um, personally, I've been developing the, 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 the computer vision algorithms at Apple Tools alone for three years. And for the past two or more years, there is a big team of very smart people working on it day and night. And uh, that's, I mean, basically the whole story. When it comes to testing at large scale, I'm talking about companies that test, run th tens of thousands of tests every day. Even if you are 99% accurate with your algorithms, that is a very high level of accuracy. 
you would still experience hundreds of false positives and it would be impossible for you to use the tool. So we are today at a place where we have a single false positives for every million checkpoints and we are continually working on improving that. Now, another thing that is important is that um, WebDriver IO, I mean, their, their, their usual pixel to pixel comparison algorithms need to compensate for the rendering differences that always occur, even though they're invisible to the human eye, we don't have time to go into that, but they use, use some kind of a threshold to compensate for that. The problem is that when you have a threshold, like 5%, 10%, uh, it's 10% that can be a bug, not a some rendering difference uh, uh, in the rendering. And this means that 10% of the page is a bug, which is a huge part of the screen, and the tool won't find it. So with Applitools, it just emulates the human eye, so you don't need to specify any percentage. There could be a huge difference that, uh, let's say, uh, a column became, in a table became one pixel wider that moved the entire page, 80% different difference pixel-wise, but we can't see it with the human eye. Applitools would ignore that completely. On the other hand, on a huge web page with tens of millions of pixels, a comma can change to a period that's just a two-pixel difference, but we will highlight it as a difference. So this is one aspect of it. Another aspect is the supporting dynamic data. So you can have uh, products with pages where products continuously change, the catalog changes, it depends who watches the page. Uh, if it's the deal of the day, now there are six products, then there are three products, the ability to understand the page, to understand the patterns in it, and being able to handle all the dynamic data is something that we can do very well. And that's, I mean, no open source tool can, uh, can accommodate that. Now, beyond that, there is the dashboard. First of all, storing all these images takes a lot of space. You need to maintain it, um, to store it, to view even the differences. It's not a difference. It's, it's not a, a, an image with the, with the pixels highlighted that you go to the file system and view it. If you're running 10,000 screenshots every run, you need a way to look at them very quickly in a gallery. You need to be able to do automated maintenance, as I shown in my demo, where I, you couldn't hear me. But you know, just the ability to accept one difference and have an AI running through all the rest of your differences and applying your decision on all of them automatically can really turn a process of several hours of work into a minute. And this is very important to scale up your tests. In addition, you know, there are many other things, um, uh, a version control system that is built into the product that allows you to have baselines for different branches looking back in history and diffing, you know, your UI, merging UI differences between branches. And last but not least, the visual grid that I told you about. So the ability to run a single test locally and have it validated, you know, on a 50 different environments, sitting in a cafe with your Mac, running a test and in one minute seeing how it looks like on i9 on, on Windows and seeing if something broke there is just fabulous and fantastic. Uh, and you won't get that for free anywhere. So that's like uh, the short answer to the to the question. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, let's go ahead and move on to our last presenter, who is going to be Kevin, and Kevin is going to be talking about the state of WebDriver I/O. So Kevin, I'll let you take it away. And uh, I'll just quickly add that. Uh, as far as what Adam said, I completely agree with what he said. I've I've worked uh, with visual regression testing for quite some time, and um, it the free tools are great for playing around with for getting a sense of is this going to work for us or is this something that we want to try out. But yeah, you really need to have that dashboard and just this huge set of things to uh, really make it work and make it scale up. So, with that, let's jump into my presentation. Okay, so I will be talking about what's new in WebDriver IO version five. Um, back in December uh, last year, the the um, folks at WebDriver IO have just they released their version five. So they used to be version four, um, and then they spent about a year making this update happen. Um, and a ton of things happened in this update, mostly behind the scenes. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, if you're not familiar with WebDriver IO, it is a WebDriver 
test framework. There is a difference between WebDriver and WebDriver IO. WebDriver is like a common standard like CSS or HTML, um, whereas WebDriver IO is a Node.js test framework for using WebDriver. Um, the biggest benefit of it, it simplifies commands by combining actions. So if you've done any Selenium testing, um, Selenium uses WebDriver. They're, um, it's, can be confusing to understand the difference between the two, but um, Selenium is, is is where WebDriver started, but it has since uh, become this, um, well, WebDriver has become its own separate thing. So anyway, uh, if you use Selenium commands, you uh, if you've ever used them before, you have to like find the element, and then in your next line, you have to click the element, and uh, in WebDriver IO, it just says, okay, find and click this ele element, in a single command instead of having to do two. That's just a basic example of how it simplifies your commands for you. Uh, one of the things that I really love about the tool is that it's extendable. It has many built-in services already for you to use, uh, one being Apple Tools. Um, it also integrates with uh, third-party uh, Selenium slash WebDriver services like Sauce Labs, Browser Stack, things like that. And then uh, you can also customize it any way you like. It has a really great system for adding in new services or um, different reporters, reporters being um, the way that you see the output of your test code and um, get that information about whether your test passed or failed. So it, it has been built um, before in version five, or before, in previous versions, they've done a lot of work to make the uh, customization uh, something that you can really get your hands dirty with and and make the, the framework work for you. So that's WebDriver IO. We'll take a look at code in just a minute. But uh, to talk about the updates, the biggest update um, is they've come in with a new package structure. So before they had the WebDriver IO base repository, and then for every service and every package and every different uh, item, those were all separate uh, GitHub repositories. For maintenance, um, the one main guy running the show, uh, he was having a lot of trouble keeping all that up to date, you can imagine. So as um, has been a common theme among um, uh, these uh, libraries and everything is to combine it into a single mono repo. So I'll show you what that looks like. Go back over here to here. So this is the, the main repo now, and we've got our packages. And you see all the official supported packages are in here. So there's services, um, there's reporters, there is a dev tool service, which uh, seems pretty cool. It hooks into Chrome dev tools. I haven't played around with it too much, but um, you also have the main WebDriver package and then a couple of other things that we'll take a look at in a minute. But all of this now lives in a single WebDriver IO uh, mono repo, which makes it uh, updating and, and maintaining it a lot easier. So we're able to get a lot more versions out. And that's evidenced by the fact that we're at version 5.7.8, even though this release happened back in December. So seven minor version updates since then and, and a number of um, patch version updates. OK, so that's the new package structure. It's mostly behind the scenes, but makes things a lot uh, simpler to maintain everything. Um, they also focused on a separation of concerns. So one thing they did was I mentioned that WebDriver IO and WebDriver are two different things. Um, they have this WebDriver package. You see there's WebDriver package and WebDriver IO. The reason for WebDriver is if you are crazy and you want to just like uh, use this base WebDriver package, you can do it now. Um, WebDriver IO will sit on top of it, but it uses this base package for you uh, so that you can do things to your heart content, like customize it as much as you want to your heart's content. And um, uh, so, yeah, again, this kind of comes back to the maintenance side of things and, and making things a little bit clearer um, and more organized. Speaking of organizing, um, a lot of the commands were reorganized. So WebDriver IO grew a bit organically, got a lot of um, various commits from the public because it is an open source project. Uh, so it uh, had a lot of kind of 
rough edges as far as differences in the way that some commands would be named or the way that you would call different commands. So uh, they spent a lot of time reorganizing the way that commands um, were put together and standardizing on them. So uh, if if you have been using WebDriver, uh, WebDriver IO version four, and you want to upgrade to version five, this is probably going to be the biggest change for you is just the different commands um, and the different ways to call them. So a quick example is one command used to be is visible, and that would check to see if the element is visible on the page. Uh, it's now called is displayed. So you would just need to go in and, and change is visible to is displayed. Um, and that the is displayed, the, the point of that change is to align it with what's in the web driver spec, the W3C spec. Um, that's the point of that. Uh, there were some commands that uh, were went away. They didn't have replacements. So keep an eye on that as well. One of the, the biggest reason for getting rid of some of those commands is um, they really wanted to aim towards full web driver compliancy. They want to follow the official spec as close as they can. Um, it does add on uh, um, extra commands for everything, but the the base layer is this um, compliancy with the web driver spec. So uh, they really want to follow best practices here. So uh, that's another big part of the change. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. There were a lot of bug fixes. Um, recently, a, um, an outside developer has added uh, React support for shadow DOM elements. Um, there's element refetching. So if the element isn't on the page, when you go to click it, it'll actually wait a few seconds and try clicking it again. And uh, that's, a, that's a really cool new feature that's going to um, help solve a lot of issues that I think people were running into. Used to, you, you have to say, wait for this element to exist, then click it. Now you can just say, click it. And it will inherently wait for the element to exist. They also did some performance improvements. There's some new services that DevTools service is new. Um, pretty cool. They also did a, a refresh on their website. So that's um, I'm glossing over a lot of the other changes. There is a full blog post. Uh, out there um, that goes over all of the changes. You can read it. Um, you just go to the, the blog section of WebDriver IO. It's all on there. Uh, and then they have a full change log of all the different changes that they've gone through here, all those element changes or the command changes. Um, so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of stuff to go through and some new features and everything. Uh, but for now, I want to give a brief demo of installing version 5 and to show you kind of how WebDriver IO works. So the first thing you'll do is you'll jump into a terminal, and you'll run the npm install command. And it used to be npm install WebDriver IO. That is uh, no longer. You will do they, they packaged everything under this WDIO organization to make it a little bit easier to um, understand like what's an official package and everything. So you'll do npm install at wdio slash CLI. That's going to install a command line interface. There are other ways to use WebDriver IO. I'm not gonna cover them for, this, for the sake of simplicity. And I'm also not gonna run this command because I already installed it. Um, and I don't wanna waste your time just watching an npm install run. So once that's installed, you can use npx wdio. And this is going to uh, check to see if you have a configuration file in your directory. So if I, um, I set this all up last night, you see I do have a configuration file. So and because I have a configuration file, this would start the test. But if I didn't have the configuration file, it would show the config generator. So this is kind of a wizard that helps you set up your configuration. So we're going to walk through this real quick. Um, it's going to ask where you want your test to be launched. There's no other option than local right now. That may change in the future. We might see a um, actually a, a Lambda runner, runner AWS Lambda, um, to help run your test. It will be interesting to see what comes of that. I'm not going to have it install the plugin runner. Usually you would say yes, but I don't want it to install. Um, Ask where you're going to run your test. We'll do our local machine, but you can do Sauce Labs or other services out there. Uh, what framework? Uh, you can choose between Mocha and Jasmine. Cucumber isn't supported at this time. The folks It used to be supported in version 4, but the folks who built that uh, haven't had time to update it yet. And there have been some 
work to update it, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, we'll say no to that. We want to run it in synchronous mode. I'm going to skip over kind of what that is, but um, it asks where our tests are located. Um, we'll just go with the folder test specs. And then the reporter we want to use, we will use spec. Um, it's just how you output the, the test. There's also a bunch of services here. We're going to use Selenium standalone. Um, this is going to start a Selenium server for us, but you could also use something like Chrome driver uh, as well. Uh, that's a little bit simpler than Selenium standalone. Um, you could use uh, Sauce Labs as well, all sorts of stuff. We'll use uh, Selenium standalone. Yeah. And then how uh, how much longer you can want, we'll just go with info, a base URL if we wanted to add it. We're not going to worry about it. So it's going to run our install for the sync package and get everything installed for us. Thankfully, all that worked. I was a little nervous because there wasn't any way to get around that installing the sync package, but it worked. OK, so we have a configuration file. I'm going to skip over that. What I'm going to do is edit a new file um, called demo.js. And um, I'm going to magically, if I get the command right, it's in some WebDriver IO code. So this is just JavaScript code, uh, a normal require. You can also write this in TypeScript if you'd like to. Um, there's ways to do that. But we will, and uh, you can get it set up through Webpack as well if you'd like to do that as well. Um, if you're familiar with Mocha.js, um, this is a Mocha describe block and a Mocha it block. Um, there might be a question out there about, does it work with Jest? I don't believe it works with Jest right now. Um, and I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. There, there's just um, some complexity to it to make that happen. But yeah, that's your normal it block. And then here's a WebDriver IO command. It says uh, browser is the main WebDriver IO um, object that has all your common commands on it. So here's a command called URL. It asks you to go to the WebDriver IO website. And then we can get the title of the page calling get title. Um, and then we can assert that the title that's returned is equal to the title that we want. So I'm going to save this and let's go ahead and run that npx wdio. And what this is going to do is it's going to start a Selenium server because that's the service that we asked for. And let's see if we get this to pop up. Okay, there's the, the website. It's going to go to webdriver.io and load the website. And you can see the title of the page at the top. It's going to get that title of the page and report that everything went well. So that's pretty cool. I want to show off a, another quick example. Um, one neat thing about WebDriver IO is that it has this debug command. And what that is going to do is it's going to stop your um, stop the test right in the middle so you can run commands in it. Before I do that, I need to set um, a timeout value. Right now, it's 60 seconds. Uh, let's change it to a lot more seconds. So that's just going to give me a little bit extra time to run um, to play around with things. So this is going to do the same thing. It's going to start that Firefox browser. It's going to load the page. And then it's going to stop in the middle of the execution, and we can mess around with things. So I'll show you a couple of other commands that we can use. Once it loads, it's a, a little slow. But you can see it says the execution has stopped. Now we can go into the browser. So what I want to do is I want to get the text of, let's see, this uh, these links. So I have a class here. There's a whole bunch of selectors I could use. But I'll just use a, a basic CSS selector. So I'll use dollar sign the same way that you would in jQuery. It's not jQuery, but it is kind of the same. Um, if I go there, you can see it returns this element information. Um, I can do nav site dot get HTML. Me, I think it's capital HTML. Now I get the HTML of that. I could also get the text. Now I've got the various text. It doesn't make a lot of sense because this is a unordered list, but I could um, also get multiple elements. Dollar sign dollar sign li get text. Um, oh, let's get the first item because this returns an array. So now we've got the first uh, first item of that. Let's go ahead and go to the API. So I'll get the second item. And I'm going to click that link. Um, so I need to select the, let's see if that works. Hey, that worked. OK, so now I've got that. Let's do one final thing. I'm going to type into this text box. 
So I've got an ID here and pretty much any CSS selector you can use to get that element. And I'm gonna call set value and we are going to search for debug. See it entered the debug text in there super quick. Um, I could also like clear the value if I wanted to. Well, uh, I think it's because it's a, a custom input, but uh, there are a bunch of these different commands, add value, set value, click, uh, get HTML, get location, get size is displayed. All of these commands are available for you to test out and try. Um, they're also the common browser commands. And when I'm done with this, I'll just hit exit and it's gonna finish my test and say that everything passed. Um, if this assert wasn't correct, then it would say that it failed. So yeah, you use WebDriver IO just for testing websites. I've been using it for years now. It's very, very handy. And um, the thing that I'll end with is I've got a new book coming out on testing web apps. Um, I've got, I made a course uh, a year or so ago, a full like 12 module, 50 video course on WebDriver IO. Um, that was for version four. I wanna update it for version five. And to do that, I'm gonna start with writing a book and then I'm gonna convert that into videos. But the main goal of this book is to teach you the ins and outs of testing an actual web app, not to teach you specifically WebDriver IO and all the different commands, but to teach you more about um, why, how you would use it in the real world. So you can go to book.clamp.in. It'll take you to the lean pub page and um, that will be that. So uh, thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, again, if you have any additional questions, feel free to post it on the chat. Um, I wanted to actually loop back before uh, Kevin started talking to give a chance for Simon to say anything about um, if you wanted to talk about Jest and the snapshot ch testing, uh, since Apple Tools covered a bunch of it. Um, talk about um, how do you have any questions about it or pitch uh, it or I don't know like just if you had any comments related to it since somebody was wondering how uh, well the question was initially um, how does Apple tools differ from just snapshot testing when both tests change in the UI but if you have nothing to say that's okay too <laughs> uh, I don't know, nothing that comes to mind. Um, yeah. The uh, the party touched about with um, certain parts changing or being a UID or something like that. I think he showed just version of it where you can say like, I expect this to be a string or a function or something. And we're serialized that instead of the actual value. So that if you have um, parts that are transient, I suppose, uh, of the output, then we support changing the, just those. Cool. The uh, my favorite feature with our snapshots is in the watch mode where you can select to update um, all of the snapshots come one on one. You can select uh, yes, I want this update. No, I don't want this update. So instead of just matching you and updating a thousand snapshots or whatever, you can uh, like okay, these are correct, and I need to look closer into these ones. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, hopefully this gave you guys a test on kind of what's happening in the front end testing world and just all the exciting things related to technology um, in testing and, and kind of like where things are going. So would love to thank our speakers again. Thank you so much, Adam from Apple Tools, Gleb from Cypress, Guillermo from Zeit, uh, Kevin Independent by his book. <laughs> Simon from Folio and Jess, and then Vikram from Angular and Google. Um, again, you can find this. Uh, this is feel free to share this, by the way, because it, it is saved on YouTube, so you can go directly to the link that you're currently on. Um, and you know, these are great for. Uh, I love to use them as lunch and learns. So we have state of browsers coming up. It's a great opportunity for you all to just you know book a conference room, order in lunch and uh, learn all about what's coming up with browsers next in May. Uh, thank you again. My name is Tracy. You can follow me on Twitter at Lady Lee, and we'll see you next time.